get ready for an enriching conversation as we welcome Dr. Chris Besson to our next episode of the Pet Parenting Reset. With over three decades of veterinary experience and a diverse range of certifications in acupuncture, chiropractic care, Chinese herbology, and oriental medicine, Dr. Besant brings a wealth of knowledge and a unique perspective to the table. Driven by her deep-rooted belief in the power of nutrition as the foundation of good health, Dr. Besant's expertise extends beyond veterinary medicine. Her dedication to promoting wellness led her to obtain a degree in nutrition, enabling her to formulate recipes using wholesome, natural ingredients. Currently, she devotes her time to the Simple Food Project, Herbsmith, and Medicus Veterinary Diets, organizations that specialize in providing personalized whole food and herbal solutions for dogs and cats. These endeavors operate from her facilities in southeastern Wisconsin. In this episode, we have the privilege of exploring the multifaceted approach to pet care advocated by Dr. Besson. Drawing upon her extensive expertise, she offers invaluable insights into the critical role of nutrition in supporting the overall well-being of our beloved companions. From the integration of Eastern medicine principles to the development of specialized diets, Dr. Besant provides a comprehensive understanding of how we can optimize our pet's health. Don't miss this opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of holistic pet care from a true trailblazer in the field. Tune in and discover how Dr. Besson's unique blend of Eastern and Western practices can transform your approach to nurturing your furry family's well-being. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Well, Dr. Besant, thank you so much for joining us today. I am so excited to have you here and to introduce you to my audience because holy moly, like your credential list is a mile long and you have so many incredible projects that you have out to the public right now that they can get access to. I really want to just talk about you, how you got where you are, and then we'll kind of jump into some of these product lines that you have available that I know I'm super excited about and the audience is going to be as well. Yes, thank so, you very much. Yeah. So yeah, if we could just, you know, who are you? What brought you to do what you do? Why do you love doing what you're doing? And kind of how, how have things evolved for you over the years? Yeah, boy, it's, um, I've been a veterinarian for um, almost 35 years now, and it's been a life's journey. And my journey has been more like the root of it was to develop as many tools as possible to help every patient that came my way. And so I, when I graduated from veterinary school, you know, we certainly had pharmaceuticals, surgical procedures, all of those, but that was boy in the, in the late eighties, early nineties. And it was fairly limited. And so I learned um, chiropractic for animals, which I just kept getting presented with all these amazing cases that that needed chiropractic care. And so I went and took the best training available in the world. And then I, um, I was the 62nd um, veterinarian certified in veterinary chiropractic. And but I went back to my practice and I knew it made logical sense. I knew I had the best Tra training available in the world. And, and I didn't charge anybody for the first six months. And I said, just, I didn't want to risk my veterinary um, reputation on a fad. And I said, I promise I won't hurt your animal, but just give me the honest truth. If it worked great, if it doesn't let me know. And 
for six months, everybody just kept calling and say, oh my God, my horse, my dog, my cat is better than they've ever been. Thank you so much. And that's when I went, okay, this isn't just a fad. This makes physiologic sense. And so then of course, as I was learning chiropractic, I had all these wonderful veterinarians that would talk about stomach 36 and bladder 22 and all these great acupuncture points that I'm like, oh, now I'm going to need to ne- learn about that. So <laughs> I went and took the best training available in the world in acupuncture. And then when you do acupuncture, you also need to use herbs. And at the time, I'm like, I don't really want to do herbs. I, I don't want to do plant walks or any of that sort of stuff. But what I found is I loved herbs and herbs really just made such great sense. And what I loved about it, it was something that a pet owner could do every day to reinforce the acupuncture that we were doing. So then I got the best training in the world in um, Chinese herbology. And so eventually what happened is my practice really evolved to this holistic veterinary practice long before holistic medicine was even considered as a possibility. And that I had all these amazingly wonderful tools to be able to help every pet that came my way. And that is really, and it, and of course that evolved then into really good food. And what I saw is that pet parents that came to, a, came to me in my veterinary practice that fed their animals well, those animals healed well and they lived well. And it was win-win for everybody. And it was noticeable. Like I could, I, I, I could see the patients that got fed well versus the patients who didn't. And that really led me down the path of food and that if we could provide good, healthy, wholesome food for dogs, that they would live long, vibrant lives. And there are a few of us in the world that would grind up a bunny or <laughs> you know, have a beef liver in our fridge for, for our animals, but the majority of people wouldn't. And so I looked at it as a veterinarian and said, okay, what would, what would it take to get good, healthy nutrition into pets? It has to not be icky. So it's not, it, it has to be something that they're not going to fill up their fridge with chicken necks and beef hearts and and all this icky stuff because the average person is not going to do that. And that's why kibble was so successful. It's such a successful product because it's relatively non-icky. It's scoopable. It's shelf stable and dogs, dogs will consume it. So freeze drying was the best way to be able to get fresh whole food to pets without the ick factor. And that shelf stable, that they were able to scoop it and serve it, and dogs loved it. So that really kind of directed me into um, the Simple Food Project and Medicus Veterinary Diets. And so not only did I do the best training in the world and then practice veterinary medicine on tens of thousands of patients for 35 years, but now in my uh, next phase of life, I run a number of companies. So I run um, Herbsmith, which is really fabulous supplements for pets um, based on Chinese medicine. And then also the Simple Food Project, which is whole food nutrition um, in a freeze dried format. And now Medicus Veterinary Diets, which is whole food freeze dried nutrition that is geared towards the sick pet. And We also own Wisconsin Freeze Dried, which is the manufacturing arm that we produce all of our own products. Boom. That's me. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's absolutely incredible. Like, as someone who has a little bit of knowledge in the food world and how food is made and um, the, you know, manufacturing plants, my... um, my audience knows this, my husband owns a food manufacturing company. And it is like the fact that you have your own (laughs) freeze drying food manufacturing plant is absolutely incredible. Like that to me blows my mind. And I'm, it makes me like your products even more because you literally control 
like every aspect you possibly can yep. of the and process. That was super important to me. Like if, because we were kind of going out on the edge, like now, now it doesn't seem like such a novel concept, but you know, 20 years ago, it seemed like a novel concept. And it was so important to me, just like, just like I practiced chiropractic for at no charge for six months to be sure that it was, it was truly as um, helpful as it should be. The same thing with um, our food manufacturing. It was important to me that every ingredient that went into it was of the highest quality and that the production was of the highest quality. And it's something that I would absolutely feed my, my pets and my friends' pets and uh, all of my patients as well. So it, it was that same kind of thought process that if I'm going to put my reputation on it, it needs to be of the highest quality. And I, and I would say it's not just me. I have wonderful people that work for me. So we have about uh, 40 to 50 employees now that are amazingly wonderful people that, that come and produce this fabulous food every day that, that are usually pet lovers as well. So <laughs> one of our, uh, when we interview it's, and how did you dress your dog up for Halloween? <laughs> <laughs> to see if you'll fit in our culture. <laughs> That's awesome. So tell me a little bit, I think most people can really wrap their heads around, like, obviously we have to feed our dogs every day. They understand that, you know, food is something we have to buy and that our dogs have to eat. Um, so I think the logical starting point for me would be with the food and then we could maybe delve a little bit into the herb smith products because that might be something that people are like uh, what are you talking about like giving my dog's herbs what are you talking about yeah yeah um so the simple food project is the one that i think most people would resonate with initially medicus is as you were saying more the are sick animals. So if we could maybe start with simple food project and like yeah. what, because it's, di it is different. Um, there aren't many companies that are doing like they're, you know, balancing with whole foods and like, that's, that's in itself, that process is novel, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really is. So what we did with the simple food project is basically, um, went back to, to, the real world or nature and said that one, it needed to be species appropriate. So that food pyramid for an animal should be, or a dog uh, or a cat. So a scavenger carnivore or a carnivore needs to have a higher percentage of meats and organs than smaller percentages of veggies. And then the least amount of fruits or carbohydrates and minimal to no grains, um, unless it's a really a high drive dog, high drive dogs, do better with um, adding some grains to their diet. But most dogs, it's about number one, being species appropriate. Then the next, so that's the basis of all the diets. And then the next was that it's whole food. So we use um, real skeletal meat, so beef and chicken. And, and then we always add organs because organs are super important for animals. So gizzards and livers and hearts that have so many nutrients in it that is not available in skeletal meat. And then all our fruits and vegetables are organic, meaning that we're going to make sure that this is of the most healthy, vibrant food that a dog could eat. And then the big thing for me was, and, the, and this is where you're talking about being novel, was why do we add all these extra vitamins and minerals to their to the food? The reason that most kibble does that is because they don't have the vitamins and minerals in the actual food itself. And that's where the going back to nature is, is that food that we eat, that our pets eat, should, th should be this beautiful synergy of all the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and phytonutrients and fiber and fat and protein, all of that should be able to nourish the pet by providing all of the basic ingredients that an animal needs to thrive and survive. And 
you should be able to get that from food. And the idea that you should have to add a vitamin and mineral pack back to it was crazy to me. I say, why don't we do it with real food? And then if there's certain nutrients that need to be added back, like you'll see in um, Medicus, we add back B vitamins. And part of it is in, for example, in a kidney animal, an animal that has kidney disease, they urinate a lot. And so they diurese all the B vitamins out. So in that particular case, we want to add B vitamins in for a very specific reason. Not that there's not B vitamins in all of the food that's in that ingredients, but because for that particular animal, they needed more. So that was the idea of let's get back to what food really should be. Make sure that each individual ingredient is in the proportions it should be of the highest quality and cleanest and then provide everything that that animal needs for nourishment. And then in Simple Food Project, of course, because I love Chinese medicine, it's also based on food energetics. So we have a warming, a cooling, and a neutral recipes that um, you could utilize, say, if your dog has allergies, they're going to tend to be really hot. And so you might want to use the cooling formula, which is duck and trout, and duck and trout is also a great option for animals that are way too hot because it's also tends to be more on the novel protein side as well. Wow. I mean, for people who are really getting into like what I feed my dog or what I feed my cat is becoming more and more important to me. The just the the whole principle of like how you set these companies up, how you decided to put these foods together and balance them is beyond, you know, I mean, it's beyond what 99% of companies out there are doing, right? <laughs> it's yeah, not just... You know, I mean, it really is a labor of love. It's really been um, a way to extend my, um, my veterinary knowledge further. So I was seeing patients all day, every day, <laughs> some Saturdays, Sundays, and loved it. And I felt, how could I influence more pets in my life than I'm ever going to see, I'm ever going to meet? But why aren't we doing this? I mean, it, when I first started with Herb Smith, for example, um, other holistic veterinarians felt like I was giving away the secret sauce. <laughs> how dare I just sell Chinese herbs to the average pet parent? And I said, well, there's only 1,200 of us at that time in the in the United States, and there's no way we could see all of those patients. So how dare you not do that? Then I felt the same thing about food. I felt like the bar for nutrition is so low for pets that anything we do is going to raise their plane of nutrition. And as I was thinking about our podcast today, one of the statements that I hate, just hate, is when people say, I never feed my dog human food. I knew you were going to say Why that. Why not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't you hate that statement? Oh my gosh. I mean, it drives me bonkers. Like, where do you think their food comes from? Like another planet? Like, <laughs> yeah. If you're eating Cheetos and pizza, yeah, don't give it to your dog. Because, But if you're eating lean meats and wholesome steamed vegetables Yes, feed some to your dog because that dog's and dog. Why do dogs love it? Because it's real food and that's what they really want. It, it, the idea that we wouldn't feed them real food is bizarre. Like, isn't it? Isn't it like just yeah. absolutely crazy yes. that we even have to make the case? Like, somehow we're taught we're conspiracy theorists. <laughs> <laughs> because we're saying, let's feed real whole food to dogs. Like, I I feel like kibble definitely feeds the world, no question. And and some food's better than no food. But I think that anything you could do could raise the plane in nutrition for your pet. So if you can, kibble is so cheap because it's made of such cheap ingredients. Mm -hmm. But if that's all you can afford, 100%, that's fine. But then if there's a sale at the grocery store and 
turkey is really on sale. Well, get some for your dog. Or chicken necks are, you know, available from the butcher. Get some for your dog. So there's many ways that you can raise their plane in nutrition without going, um, you know, all, you know, crazy about it. You can definitely every day raise their plane in nutrition. And I would say that like the raw coated kibble that you'll see out these days is, is, is kind of in that idea. It's still kibble. It's mm -hmm. still heavily processed, hard nuggets made of poor quality ingredients, but then they add a good ingredient <laughs> on top of it. So, it, so it still is, is taking it up that little bit of plain and nutrition. Yeah. I think if people realized what they were actually buying, That's it would be so thing. much cheaper for them to just buy the regular bag and add fresh food, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> so 100%. much cheaper for them to do that. A hundred percent. Yeah. It actually, it would be actually cheaper in the long run to feed whole food, to, to home cook, to wait for their sales, to make their diet and freeze it. I mean, really for the amount that food costs these days, you could absolutely, um, be making whole food. And and ideally, if you made home cooked diet, that would be the ideal. If you can't do that, then Simple Food Project is your next choice. Awesome. Yeah, I know it is definitely long term. That's kind of one of the the sticking points that I I have a hard time getting across to people is like think long term. Think the yeah. 15 20 years that this dog is going to be living with you and the vet bills and what if they get cancer and obviously it's not a guarantee that they won't there are so many other factors but i mean goodness gracious <laughs> it's expensive out there <laughs> right and and i've always said as a veterinarian pay now pay later you know either you're going to feed your dog well their whole lives and not have to do veterinary care or if you love your or less veterinary care because they're going to less likely to get sick or you're going to pay small amounts every day to feed them well. Because it, if you look at the statistics, the chronic dietary issues that happen in people, uh, it's mirrored in animals. In fact, I would say almost the opposite. I would say that, that animals are the canary in the coal mine mm -hmm. for what's going on in human nutrition. So when you look at... Um, it, you look at heavily, heavily processed foods that humans eat and animals eat and the incidence of type two diabetes and kidney disease and cancer, all of those things are all long-term chronic poor nutrition or chronically eat, ingesting um, low-grade toxins that, that, we sh that shouldn't be in our food. So what we're seeing in pets is exactly what mirroring what we're seeing in humans as well. So if you don't care as much about for your pet care for yourself and what you do for yourself, cells are cells, you know, whether it's a dog or a cat or a human, um, we're seeing the same processes occurring. Yeah. So the Medicus diets specifically, I am like enthralled with because that is another big sticking point, I think, with a lot of people who are, even the, the people who are out there saying, I know that I want to do something different for my dog or cat, but my vet is telling me uh -oh, I have to froze. give them this prescription diet, otherwise the worst is going to happen. And those prescription diets are huge sticking points with people because they're scared. And so the, the Medicus veterinary diets are providing the same principles of nutrition for what these specific ailments are in our pets, but they're doing, you're doing it with really high quality, good ingredients, right? Yeah, you got it. You, you've got it. Thank you. Um, what I found is as a veterinarian, people fed their dogs really well and their cats really well their whole lives. And so they would never consider adding some really low grade kibble. Then if, if their animals got sick for some reason, they would find themselves in their veterinary clinic 
and they would find, say, a dog with kidney disease, and they would get the diagnosis, which is bad enough, and then they would get presented with this bag of heavily processed therapeutic kibble. And those pet parents know that that's not good for their animals, but they're scared, as you said, and they want to do anything possible to help them. So they find themselves carrying this expensive bag of therapeutic food home before they're like, they read the ingredient deck and go, why would I be feeding my dog with kidney disease corn and soy and sorghum and rice and all of these ingredients that are not good for pets. So when my animal is the sickest, when they need nutrition more than ever, I've now taken like 10 steps, 10 steps backwards in their plane of nutrition, and I'm going to feed them this heavily processed food. And Medicus is really here to change that. So I give kudos to the, the makers of therapeutic diets because they are one of the first companies in the world that said nutrition really matters, especially in sick animals. But as you said, here's where I have the problem with it. I have the problem with the idea that nutrients are super important. And I agree with that 100% that if a dog has kidney failure, you need to low, have a low phosphorus diet because phosphorus cannot be excreted from the kidneys when the kidneys are marginal. So you need to decrease the amount that they're getting in their diet. So I agree with the nutrient composition needs to be correct for that particular animal's issues. What I don't agree with is why do we have to use garbage ingredients to make that happen? Why can't we use whole food? There's absolutely no reason why we couldn't. So what I set out to do, and I worked with a number of other holistic veterinarians and really great nutritionists. And what I did is took whole food and then combined it and put it together in different quantities and different amounts to hit the exact same nutrient profile as the therapeutic diets do, but do it with whole food. And it wasn't easy. I mean, it, 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 it took about 10 years to really hone it down. And I would say that one of the, probably what most um, pet owners that are knowledgeable about nutrition will say is, why is there rice in the kidney diet? The reason that there is, and I remember literally the moment that I decided, oh my God, I have to add rice is that meat is really high in phosphorus. And so in order to go with the species appropriate diet, it's way too high in phosphorus. And so when I added rice back into it, added rice into the diet, all of a sudden I still had great protein and I still had really uh, moderate levels of healthy, clean, fresh protein and amino acids, but I was able to lower the phosphorus down. So it was, it was formulating a diet that was for that specific issue. And so I, I, it, I was amazed that, um, that it was something I really needed to talk a lot about. And, and I think that the idea that what a sick animal should eat is different than what a healthy animal should eat was something so foreign to people. And, and, and you and I are getting the word out there that we can do the same thing with whole food nutrition. We can, and, and whether it means that you're buying the Medicus diet or you're um, making your own home cooked diet, great. But I think that it's really important that we make sure that the nutrient profiles are correct. Because what was happening is it was one or the other. So People either went with this horrible therapeutic diets because they were scared and it was the only thing available, or they were saying, I'm not doing that. And then they would go to a, a, a diet that would be fabulous for a healthy animal, but it wasn't helping your animal that was sick. And that neither one was appropriate, right? Neither one mm -hmm. was good for them. And Medicus it brought it somewhere into the middle that is really um, more appropriate for when they're ill. And 
And there's kind of two ways that I looked at Medicus. One was we need to be really restrictive in something. So for like kidney disease and bladder disease, um, you really needed to be restrictive in the minerals. So restrictive that it would be unhealthy for a healthy dog to eat it. And those ones are by prescription. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is you need a veterinarian involved. You need to get repeated blood work. You need to... It's so restrictive, it would make a healthy dog sick. So it shouldn't just be something that you could buy off the, off the shelf. The other Medicus diets were, were, instead of restrictive, it was additive. So for example, our cancer diet is like the best food out there. So we use 80-20 ground beef, that's human grade ground beef, and we use beautiful, wholesome organs and organic fruits and vegetables and high omega-3 fatty acids and high and crazy amounts of antioxidants to just flood the body. So provide this amazing, amazing nutrient, dense, rich food for animals that every bite matters. So um, part of cancer is the cancer starts pulling all the nutrition away from the cells of the body. And that's why dogs get so thin and um, depleted because the cancer is taking all of the nutrition. So it was really, really important that we add that nutrition so that every bite that cancer patient eats is going to nourish their body. So those formulas are not by prescription because there's no harm in doing them. So you could feed um, the cancer diet to your dog, just because I want the highest quality food out there. Absolutely. You could do that. So there's no harm in doing those. Well, I think that that is, I mean, some of the best <laughs> food out there for sure. But also like, like I said at the beginning, like giving these people who are receiving these diagnoses at their veterinarian's office, some other option because pre pre medicus <laughs> yeah. it was you know if you knew enough to know i'm not feeding this but also what i'm feeding isn't great i, I can't keep doing this you you basically have to go to a nutritionist to have a meal plan made up for you so and so few people know about that and have access to that right um so yeah, I, this is, and you're this really is incredible. Making disease, you know, you're, you're scared. You're, you have yeah. so many other things you need to take care of now for your pet. And so now to just dive, you know, hugely into creating your own food and, and cooking it and making it perfect for them. Wow. That just adds so much more to your already stressed life. True. Oh, very true. Very true. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. living with and, and managing sick animals is incredibly taxing. And I, I mean, just having seen your animals, whether they're healthy or in some form of, you know, some state of disease, like it is, it's, sad. it's you're sad. It's ta it's, it is. Yeah. It's like, it's for me, it's like a cloud over my life. And mm -hmm. until they're healthy again, then that cloud goes away. But otherwise, I'm like hyper focused on how am I going to help them and care for them and nourish them and do everything right to get there to allow their body to heal. And I think that kind of goes back to that that idea of synergy that we talked about originally in food and that synergy of all the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and 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 the knowledge that the the wisdom of food and that if we provide everything that that animal needs that body needs to nourish itself that's our job with food right is to not just get by not just to keep them alive but to provide them with all of the ingredients, all the tools that that body needs to be able to nourish itself. And to, and most importantly, now they have to heal themselves. So it's not mm -hmm. even just sustaining status quo. Now it's fighting this cancer. It's decreasing the immune response. It's, it's, mar it's making the most of the kidney function that we have left. And 
So it, it, and, and I, I don't know about you, but I, I've, in my journeys through all of this, I've always been amazed at how quickly you see a difference when you start feeding real food. Like it, in the beginning, I, you know, way in the beginning as a veterinarian and I was feeding a kibble and I had this wonderful collie, but she had just a terrible coat. And I just, <laughs> I loved her. And to me, it was, I thought, well, she's just poor quality, you know, genetics started feeding her whole food. Oh my God. Within a week, her coat just bloomed and it became full and healthy and dark colored, you know, it's now like a really rich black and a really rich rush. She was a tricolor. And to me, that was like, wow, that is, that is amazing. And, and you know how, um, God always kind of points you in the right direction. And, and every time I would, as a veterinarian, I think, mm, I'm just, you know, is this just wishful thinking? There would be a, a patient that would come that was like dramatically better than they had ever been before. And, and, and I could only attribute it to either the herbs that we were using or the food that we were feeding. Yeah. My, journey with fresh food actually started with a dog that I adopted who, oh Lord, she was a hot mess, but she had seizures. Mm. And um, we had started feeding Dr. Judy's pup loaf. And about six months later, I turned to my husband and I was like, when was the last time Claire had a seizure? And we, just by feeding whole fresh foods, she went a good three, three and a half years without any seizures at all. Wow. And her seizures were bad. She was a little Pomeranian and they were so, she literally would do backflips mm -hmm. when she was seizing and they were rough and she had mm -hmm. a hard time coming back out of them. And, um, she didn't start getting seizures again. And, I think she only had one more right at the end of her life. Wow. And it was just like the biggest wake up call to me. <laughs> it was like, I did nothing different, but feed her real food. That's amazing. It was That's incredible. Yeah. Um, and then as, as, a dog trainer, I have been going in to homes and that's one of the first things I talk to people about. And I put myself out of a job because most of the time, these people <laughs> that I train, I, we put them on a fresh food diet or at least add fresh food to their existing diet and their behavior, I mean, they're, they're night and day. Yeah. And they are so much more easy to manage. They focus, they listen better. And it's like, you don't need me anymore. <laughs> I'm happy about that. Right. That's how I feel as a veterinarian as well, is that if you're eating healthy, fabulous food, you're not going to get sick you're, or not mm -hmm. as sick. And if you do yeah. get sick and need, you know, I'm, I, I wouldn't say that, that we don't need all of veterinary medicine. Thank God that we have it. Thank God we have pharmaceuticals when we need them. Thank God mm -hmm. we have surgical procedures when we need them. But if we're feeding good food, we're developing this foundation of health that if they need to get subjected to pharmaceuticals for whatever reason, they can tolerate them better and they can, they can come back better. If they need surgery, they heal better. Mm -hmm. And what I found is it's win-win for everybody. It's the pet heals better. The veterinarian looks like a superstar because they heal better. Mm -hmm. And the pet parents thrilled to death because that, that cloud over their life goes away faster. So yeah, I, I, I can't say enough. And I would say that someday we're it, it, somebody's going to listen to your podcast and go, why was she feeding a kibble anyhow? <laughs> like, you know, like right now we have in this day and age, we have to make this case for feeding real food. Hopefully in 20 years, we'll be like, you were feeding kibble? Of I course know. all these things are oh. happening. Yeah. I think, I think that it really has changed. I mean, it, it having you guys and you producing this podcast that you're really just sharing these stories are going to open the eyes to so many more pet parents that how did we get convinced that dog, sh dog food should be this heavily processed 
brown nuggets that comes in a giant bag that can be open to the world for years and still be fine? How did we get convinced that that was the way to feed our pets? And hopefully we'll bring in this new generation of pet owners that um, don't think that, that see, they haven't drunk the Kool-Aid. They see the wisdom of, of real food. Yeah, it's the mark. I mean, we are we are so heavily indoctrinated in the marketing of these companies. It is yeah, it's hard. It it can be difficult to pull people out of it. Um, but we're trying our best. <laughs> and I think one of the reasons, Jessica, and I was going to say this earlier, is when you walk down the um, dog food aisle of your grocery store and you see these bags, and the bags. They look beautiful, right? The the bags have like these pictures of trout swimming in a stream and they have this beautiful picture of chicken breast and fruits and vegetables. And if what was on the bag, the pictures, was actually in the food, you and I wouldn't be talking about this today. But mm-hmm. the truth of the matter is, is yes, there is the DNA of chicken in that food. It's not that big, beautiful chicken breast that a human would eat. It is rendered chicken meal. It's heavily processed ingredients. It's the leftovers that nobody wants to talk about. But the FDA and the FTC allows that to be on the bag. And if they really put what was on the bag a picture of this rotten chicken, <laughs> yeah. and this heavily processed brown powder. If they put that on the bag, the average consumer would go, oh, I don't want to buy that for my dog. Right. And I literally, I every time I walk down the pet food aisle, I think this isn't that bad because those <laughs> pictures just scream to you that this is good, healthy nutrition. Like, for example, if they have blueberries all over the bag, you might look at on the ingredient deck and you know that anything below, anything below salt is less than 0.1% of the recipe. So when blueberry is one of the last ingredients, that means that there's one blueberry in that whole 50-pound bag. Now, don't tell me that that is really the message you got mm-hmm. <laughs> when you looked right. at that bag that had pictures of blueberries on it. So really the consumer is being deceived. Mm-hmm. And and I know I, it sounds conspiracy theory, but the fact is it's the truth. Does it have the DNA of blueberry in there? Yes. So therefore they can put it on the label. Is it deceiving and misleading? Absolutely. Very much so. Very much so. So, <laughs> oh my God, I just die now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's that, but it's the truth. Like somebody has to say it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it's really disheartening, and and so many people. I think I think it, it can be so jarring to to people who really think they are doing the best right. for their pet. Right. That Nobody they, says yeah. they feed bad food. Nobody says Right. That. Right. So, um, yeah. So I was trying to think of a smooth segue into Herb Smith, but <laughs> here we are. <laughs> well, here's a smooth segue. Um, if, if every single phytonutrient and every single um, nutrient could be available in the food, that would be ideal. Um, But there are certain reasons why it can't. So for example, you always need to feed, even if you're feeding healthy, wholesome food, you probably still need to add a glucosamine source as a supplement. And the reason being is that in the real world, what would happen is that dog would take down the prey and he would eat the organs and he would eat the skeletal meat and then he would chew on the bones. And when he was chewing on the bones, he would eat the cartilage caps from the bones and he would ingest the synovial fluid, the joint fluid, and that would provide his body everything that he needed. In the way that um, animals are processed, those cartilage caps are basically thrown away. 
and they're not being utilized because if they ground up the bone to put into the to put into the food, it would be way too high in calcium. So what do we see that's left over after um, a carcass has been um, utilized in the in nature? The bones are left because that's still calcium. And so the wildlife will consume everything that is available to them and then bones are still there. And so in the way that we develop um, pet food, that's just not something that's um, easily captured to be able to go back into the food. So that's one of the reasons that you would need to supplement that. Another reason that you would need to supplement is probiotics. And the FDA, rightly so, says that there should be no bacteria in food. And so there cannot be salmonella and there can't be E. coli, but there also cannot be good bacteria either. And, and the reason being is that if you have a food that has bacteria in it and it's going to go from your manufacturing plant to a warehouse, to a distributor, to a store, to finally to your home, how much time has that bacteria been sitting in there that could grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. You're not feeding it fresh. So because of the zero tolerance for any bacteria in food, you have to add bacteria back. And so that's why you'd want, you always want to add a probiotic or a prebiotic to your pet's food because you want them to have good, healthy bacteria, not the negative bacteria. Um, and another good example of, of why you would need to add a supplement is omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3 fatty acids are really, really limited in most kibble. And one, because it gets damaged during the heat processing. And the other is it can go rancid. And so you really adding that as a supplement is a great way to prevent rancidity from occurring in the food itself. So as long as long as you're not going to grind up that rabbit and feed <laughs> and feed that fresh whole food diet to your pet, if you if you're going to be cooking or you're going to be um, using a product like um, Simple Food Project that is as close to fresh as it can be, there are still things that you need to add back into their diet to support health and wellness. And then Herbsmith also gets deeper into. Um, particularly nutrients that are needed in higher quantities for animals with the with the issues. So, for example, a dog with allergies has this hypersensitivity reaction, and they get hot and inflamed. And there's these wonderful Chinese herbs that can help bring down that heat and inflammation. And um, Glimmer, which is another product that we have, which is really high in GLA and omega six fatty acid that is necessary for skin barrier. So many of the Herbsmith products are kind of things that you should add to every pet's diet that is getting a shelf-stable food. And then there are many in the Herbsmith product line that are for specific issues. So a dog, let's say, goes to the dog park, gets exposed to Giardia, has some loose stool for a while, and that, that loose stool causes impactions of the anal sacs. So the sacs around the hind end that mm -hmm. produce that smell on the stool. So we produce these really cool high fiber bars called butt bars. And the butt bars <laughs> literally produce high fiber so that when they produce stool, it's firmer and it causes the natural expression of those anal sacs. So there's times that you want to add other things to your pet's diet to for specific things that they have going on. So the best way to think of is you're supplementing, but you're supplementing a good quality diet. Not not saying that just because you're in a good quality diet, you don't need anything else. Mm -hmm. There's still other things that you need. And we do this really cool thing. It's called Curate the Bowl. And it, you have you done it yet? I haven't. No. You fill out all the, you go to herbsmithinc.com and you fill out all the details about your pet. And then I personally look at it and make recommendations. And the recommendations might be, have you considered chiropractic or acupuncture is really helpful for this, or here's the Medicus diet I'd recommend and then transition to simple food project, or I would recommend butt bars and microflora. So 
Um, so I will literally look at every single one of those and make recommendations as to kind of a course of action that could help you um, combat whatever issue it is, which unfortunately the majority of issues are allergies and GI issues. No surprise, right? No surprise at all. And I am absolutely amazed that you look at every one of those. <laughs> we, I do. I actually enjoy it. And, and what I really love is people uh, give me pictures. Love the pictures. Like just, it just warms my heart when I see this little Boston Terrier with a, with his bow tie on. I'm like, you need help with your poop, but you do. <laughs> <laughs> so really, I, I, I actually enjoy doing it because it's like uh, keeping me in veterinary practice, even though I don't practice anymore. I, I manage these companies and consult with veterinarians. Yeah, it's hard to walk away when you start seeing how much of a difference you're making in these animals lives is so rewarding it's i have i imagine it would be very hard to walk away from that <laughs> it, it was what i did is i um as i was transitioning into the business side of it what i did is just stop taking any new patients so i cared for patients that i had until they passed and then i didn't i just didn't replace them with any new ones and Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until just recently that the last one passed. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but this way, like talking with you is going to, is going to be a positive influence on thousands of dogs lives that I will never know. I'll never meet, but hopefully mm -hmm. you and I will plant the seed that, that there's more that you can do to support your dog's health. So I, I still feel like it's a positive influence. Oh, absolutely. And I can't thank you enough for joining me today and sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom with the world. And I'm just, so, I'm so grateful to um, Dr. Ruth for bringing all of your wonderful information into her holistic health coaching program, because that's where I learned about you. And oh, she's so um, She's amazing. She really is. She really is. She's so <sighs> calm and like just brilliant. She's really gonna, brilliant. Yeah. Like the way she manages and deals with people, I'm just like, bless your heart. How do you, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you so, so very much. Where can people um, purchase these products. Uh, and I'm sure some of them, they would need to get like the, some of the prescription diets through their veterinarian, but where can they find these products and, and where can people follow you on social media? Maybe? Yeah. Yeah. I have an Instagram page and a Facebook page and, um, the Facebook page, we do lots of education. So it's lots of why is an omega-3 so important? And so lots of, um, Lots of good, solid information, science-based. Um, so you can reach me on Instagram, Facebook, um, and all of our websites. So Herbsmith is herbsmithinc.com. And that's where you'll find the Curate the Bowl um, and all of our wonderful supplements. And then the simplefoodproject.com and medicusveterinarydiets.com. And you can, um, for Medicus, you can order um, all of the diets yourself. And then you're, if it's one that needs a prescription, then your vet could just um, email us a prescription form or call us and let us know that they approve of it. But we just need some verification from their veterinarian. So the veterinarian doesn't need to sell it to them, to them although they could. Um, they can also just buy it and get a prescription like they would get a prescription for any um, pharmaceutical. Awesome. Well, that makes it a lot easier, I think, for a yeah. lot of people. But I know because I, I'm on the Medicus list, you have really great webinars mm -hmm. on like explaining the why behind every single one of the Medicus veterinary diets. So can people also ask their veterinarian, say, hey, like maybe you should look into stocking these. Is that a possibility? And then Absolutely. the veterinarian could actually go through your training and education. Yes, 100%. That is, that's the ideal is that the veterinarians would have it in their, um, 
just like just right next to Hills Diet. If you're going to have Hills Therapeutic, here's another option. If you're if you've always fed good healthy food, here's a good healthy food option. Um, they absolutely can do that. They can do it either by they could write a script, the vet and the pet parent could come to us. They could have it in their veterinary clinic. They could um, make a recommendation and write the script. But I would say that it's almost going to be have to be a grassroots effort of converting veterinarians because the difference is with Medicus, although it's not cheap, we put all of our money into the good quality food. And when you go against um, a therapeutic diet that uses really poor quality nutrition, they have tons and tons of money to buy veterinarians. So mm -hmm. when you go to a veterinary um, convention, it's the Hills and therapeutic diet companies have giant booths and they give away hats and jackets and, and books and, and all this stuff. And it's a lot of propaganda that, that vets buy into. And prior to this, and God bless veterinarians, because prior to this, they had no other tool, right? pre medicus there wasn't another tool right. to be able to utilize. Well, hopefully, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to take time for people to realize it, because I think once a vet gets indoctrinated into this is the way we do it, there's no other thought. And and it's going to take pet parents with some common sense to say, eh, this just makes more sense. Yeah. So definitely the next time you go to your veterinarian's office, um, ask them about the Medicus diet and keep asking them about the Medicus diet, because when you plant a seed in their head, then they can start looking at alternatives as well. So I think that is going to be one of the best ways to just, just for everybody going into their veterinarian's office saying, hey, I think this would also be really good for you to have here. And I'd like to buy it from you, but you'd have to have it first. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I would love your, I would love your seal of approval on it. That's, and, mm -hmm. it, and I, it, um, you know, I've been doing this for so long that, you know, years ago people, um, veterinarians would really protest if you were feeding a raw diet and they're like, and so pet parents would be reluctant to tell their vet that they're feeding a raw mm -hmm. diet. And I always thought that was nuts. I said, you need a new vet because mm -hmm. you need a vet that, that feels the way you feel about things. And that if they are staunch, if they're going to make you feel bad or, or diss you every time or cram their dogma down your throat, you need to go to a vet that doesn't think like that. And there's plenty of us out there that don't feel that way. So instead of being intimidated by your vet, your vet needs to be your team member and they need to, they need to have the same thought process. And I would say that, <coughs> excuse me, um, the whole uh, um, shift of thinking where it went from raw food, from kibble to raw food is going to be the same thing. That same shift of thinking is going to have, have to happen of going from therapeutic kibble to a therapeutic whole food. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Hopefully though, we can get there a little quicker since we've, <laughs> since we've gotten through the, or, or we're, well, we're still working, I guess, on the, from the kibble to the raw food, but there's enough of us that they are, you know, the big kibble manufacturers are concerned enough. They're losing enough profit that they are concerned about it. So there are enough of us to make a change. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's just common sense, isn't it? I mean, it's just, I've always been like, how could you, I think so. <laughs> how could you not say this is correct? It's just common sense. For sure. Well, thank you so much. And if, if anything, I'd love to end on that. Um, what you just said about your veterinarian being a team member, that is something I, I, talk about a lot that we, you know, curate a team of healthcare and other providers for our pets and that we're the head of the team exactly. for our pet. Yeah. And so be, you know, educate yourself and learn and learn and learn and never stop learning and be comfortable and confident with the team members you have helping you uh, raise, hopefully, a happy, healthy, thriving pet. Absolutely.
So thank you so much, Dr. Besson. And yeah. I will, all of the links I will have in the show notes. Okay. So you can easily just click and go. And uh, any, any parting words for our wonderful audience? If you know better, you do better. You know, wherever you're, I, wherever you're starting is okay. Um, but Look at the common sense behind fresh food. And I know that's not like a great party statement, but <laughs> yeah, I would say that, you know, the, the concept that nobody ever says they're feeding bad food is, is so telling. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes, and people get so defensive when you say that is a bad food. No, no, it's the best kibble out there. You know, I've, tried to wrap my head around that, but there is not a best kibble. There really isn't. And that's a hard thing to say. And, and, but anything they do steps the plane of nutrition up. And so anything you do with fresh whole food is going to be a good thing. Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Anything you do with fresh whole nutrition. <laughs> Totally fine. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It is. Nature provides, and anything you can do with fresh, whole nutrition is going to up the game, up and, and improve the playing field for your pet. That's perfect. Thank yep. you so much again. And I hope all of you listening have a wonderful rest of your day and give your pet some extra love from me and Dr. Besant today. Today's episode is brought to you by the Furry Family Coach Dog Training. Train your dog in the comfort of your own home and on your schedule with video instruction from me. Learn the foundations of training, teach basic cues to your dog, and explore solutions to behavioral issues all inside of this video-based online training course. Go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to see you on the inside. Oh, oh.